Thank you. Thank you and welcome. I'm Father Mr. Packer and welcome to Threshold of Hope. Normally we take a look at documents, but today we're going to do emails. Uh, there's a backlog. This is loaded with them. So we're going to try to catch up with some of your emails. And of course, you can send us your questions by writing to threshold at EWTN.com. All right, let's take a look at what we've got here. Um, first of all, we have an email from Katie. Uh, Dear Father Paco, as a Catholic teen, how should I be around friends who have different religious views? How should my approach or behavior be around them? And how should I treat their views also? How do you explain the term agree to disagree regarding the faith is wrong? Thank you, Katie. Well, interesting set of questions, Katie. On one hand, you know, the way that you uh, should be around your friends with different religious views is have fun. Um, you're a Catholic teenager and enjoy your friends. Enjoy their company and uh, be part of it. Now, uh, and besides having fun, there's also times, as, especially as you get into teenage years, where you start dealing with a lot more serious issues. And uh, when it comes to dealing with religion, how should my approach or behavior be around them? How should I treat their views? You begin with treating them with respect. They may or may not treat you with respect, depending on the way their own personality is. But your approach is to treat yourself and them with respect. Um, you know, you don't need to put up with any mistreatment from them, and you should certainly never give them mistreatment. You take their views seriously as something that they have thought through, or perhaps when some of these friends would bring up the differences regarding religion, this is their way of starting to think through the issues. They have a background, but they're trying to work it out for themselves and follow through, and you know, that's, that's fine. Uh, again, don't you know, allow yourself to be um, overly disrespected. Uh, demand respect and demand of yourself that you give it. That's always key. But then in terms of the question agree to disagree being wrong, that would be the case in math, wouldn't it? If you have, if you're, if you're doing algebra homework together, uh, do you think that the teachers say, well, let's just agree to disagree on the right answer? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. If you're doing a, uh, a course in chemistry, well, let's just agree to disagree about the way certain chemicals interact and pay no attention to the explosion that happened over in the, in the laboratory. No, you can't do that. And religion is, on a certain level, far more important because it goes to the meaning of life. And so uh, try that as a way to think about it. But at the same time, one of the real issues going on will be that you both may be ignorant of the facts concerning a certain issue. You may not know enough history. You may not know enough about the biblical languages. And so use the opportunity where you disagree to say, well, let's both check the facts. Let's go find out what's right or wrong and do some homework. So that, uh, because most of the time that arguments become very heated is when people don't know the facts, but they insist on the little they do know instead of realizing that all of the heat 
that they're producing in an argument comes out of their ignorance, and what they need to do is get light by going to look up the facts. And one of the things you'll see, Katie, is that there are huge amounts of material available to explain Catholicism, and good answers are available, so you have to become more educated as well as motivate your friends to do the same. All right, we have another email here from Gloria. Hi, Father Mitch. God knows all things. Therefore, he knew that man would fall into sin. He also knew that the angels would fall into sin. However, he did not redeem the angels. He only redeemed man. Now, understand that the angels had preternatural gifts, but so did Adam and Eve. Why not give the angels a second chance on choosing eternal life versus eternal hell? Well, you're dealing with a difference in natures. Human beings are spirit and matter. We have body, soul. And angels are pure spirits. Highly, you know, super intelligent, pure spirits. They have will, and so do we. They have intellect, and so do we. So you have those things going on. However, as most of us notice, when, say, simple situation, we're trying to go on a diet. We make a decision, i got to lose some weight, so I'm going to just, you know, watch my diet. And then you see the chocolate ice cream, or you're just driving past places like Hamburger Heaven with great milkshakes, and you say, ooh, but that would taste good. Your memory of the taste of that those milkshakes that got you overweight in the first place uh, still rings true. And your body wants to go to this other thing, to, to go and break your diet. You know, you see a chocolate cake, you want to put it in your mouth. That's simple, simple way of, of understanding things. So um, angels don't have that going on. They make a decision without a body that pulls them in another direction. So when they make a decision, it's final. If, if you can think of, say, a computer that when you set, you know, type something into a program, then that, that's, that's done. The computer does exactly what you told it to do. It won't do what you may have wanted it to do, it will only do what you told it to do. It's, you know, it doesn't have, well, I, I want to please the person who owns me. No, a computer doesn't care. A computer just does what it's told. And it's, there's, there's a finality to that. And then you have to start over again, at least in the old days with those cards that you used to have and all. Uh, I have to start all over again. Um, there's something of an analogy there in that Angels make a decision, and it's done. They, they can't undo it. If God you know, could give them a second chance that would make a difference, then God would. But it's against the nature of angels to choose differently. That's why when we go to heaven, we won't be tempted like we were here on earth. In heaven, we'll be pure spirit, and we'll be free of those temptations. So we don't have to worry about, well, maybe I'll you know, have a hankering to go and steal a cake from somebody down on earth. No, you won't do that. Um, you'll be a pure spirit like the angels. So that's, that's why you can't, okay? And the angels can't change their mind. It's against their nature, not God's arbitrariness. Father Mitch, I'm seriously considering um, coming to the Roman Catholic Church, and I admit the struggle with foul language and gossiping. Do you have any advice of how I can overcome this? Because I don't want to be the type who confesses the exact same sins every time I go to confession. Stephen from Tennessee. Well, uh, welcome, Stephen. 
I would love to have you in the church. Now, a couple things I would say. If you do commit the exact same sins, be sure to confess them anyway. Um, we priests hear uh, confessions uh, of sin repeated. It, it, it proves a point, I, and I, it's something I've learned over almost, four, well, now 41 years of being a priest. Um, the sins are pretty much the same. That's why the sinners tend to be pretty boring. You know, they, they, they do the same sins, and they're, they're not that interesting. The saints, huh, they're very interesting. Those are some very, and, and uh, want to hang around with people like um, Mother Teresa of Calcutta or Mother, you know, um, uh, well, all kinds of people that, that we know that were very, very holy. They're interesting people. Mother Angelica was very interesting. The sin is about the same. So, but you confess them anyway. However, what you're expressing here is called a firm resolve to amend your life. You really want to change your life. And some sins become habits. What we need to do <coughs> is find antidote habits. All right? So, uh, uh, for instance, uh, in terms of foul language, one of the things that you may want to do is think of uh, praising God. Now, some people um, will do all kinds of, uh, of words you know, when they miss a golf shot. See, especially the people who say, well, I, I go to play golf on Sunday morning. I feel closer to God when I'm out in nature than I do in church. However, the reports I also get is that their language are not close to the language of the hymns, you know, especially when they miss, which apparently they often do. And so I'm not impressed by the good impact of the beauty of nature on their own angry nature. But be that as it may, what you can learn to do is instead of cussing, you praise God for missing. The, you know, the, I guess you're, I don't know, I don't play golf. I don't know how, I've never played it in my life. But I know that people miss or they don't shoot uh, the ball quite as long as they would like uh, when they're trying to hit it or they veer off into uh, ponds of water or sand traps. And instead of cussing, what you may want to do is that, thank you, Jesus, I get to go into the sand trap. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> Oh, and, and you, praising God is a good antidote to the bad language. When it comes to gossiping, the antidote would be, if you say you've, you know certain people that it's easy to gossip about, right? and, and especially at work or in the family, what you want to do is um, uh, distinguish between the kind of talk you do about somebody, that simply means, well, I'm above that. I may be bad, but I'm not that bad like he or she is. That's, that's arrogance. That's, that's problematic. But you also, there are times in which, say, you're talking about a, a child. You have a child who is having a, a problem of some kind. You can talk about that for the sake of trying to understand that child or understand the way that a parent has affected you. And that's not gossip. Gossip is, you know, a chattiness that usually puts the gossiper, in their own mind anyway, puts them in charge of the situation. Well, this person, can you believe what they did and how they dressed? Instead, the antidote to that kind of gossip is twofold. One, start raising up conversations where you compliment them. Look for things you can say positively about that. And when, say, you're at work and people start to gossip, well, you know who was out all last night and came dragging in here looking all disheveled. Well, look for a way to say something kind about them or to step away from foolish conversations. The other thing you can do, and this is always, always good, 
is to look for an opportunity to pray for the person you gossip about. I recommend the Divine Mercy Chaplet. You know, pray the chaplet for that person. Have mercy on us, not just on them, but on us. Or pray the rosary for them. Uh, you know, it's pray for us sinners. Not pray for that sinner. Oh, that person is a mess. And Lord, let me tell you, don't gossip to God about them either. You know, <laughs> that doesn't do you any good. But praying for them is another antidote. Um, a, a, a common sin that I hear these days is an addiction to pornography. A good antidote, there are a number of antidotes there, but one of them is pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet or the Rosary for the people you're looking at. I'll bet they're not hanging out with a crowd that tends to pray for them when they're off of their work. Uh, some of them might be uh, sexual slaves. So pray for them to have mercy. And again, it's pray for us and have mercy on us. That includes us in the prayer, and that helps to change our attitude. So all kinds of, you know, you can... Think careful about all the different kinds of sins you commit and find antidotes. Not just, oh, I gotta stop gossiping. Boy, I got a juicy piece. No, 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 you don't. <laughs> you don't just struggle against it. Take an antidote. All right, here's another one from Bianca in San Antonio, Texas. Dear Father Paco, I want to start a Catholic blog. What would be good resources to use to make sure that all the content is accurate? Well, Bianca, first of all, you bring up something that's very, very important. Um, I've uh, been recently looking at some uh, points on the Internet. I've been doing some research on the church's social teaching. And in so doing, I find incredible statements that are patently, provably false. That the Catholic Church started slavery and it was the, the popes who, uh, you know, got slavery going. You know, that, that's one of the issues I've been re-examining. Um, and, you know, I, I look and <laughs> I see what they say the popes said, then I go, and here's what I do. When I see that, I then go look up the document. I try to find the actual document. A lot, even some of the old ones can be found. It's not always easy, but some, many of them can be found. Uh, and what you discover is just the opposite of what some of these websites claim. It was actually the, the, the slave trade was primarily run by the various Muslim empires beginning in the 650s AD when they established the, uh, the, the uh, Umayyad uh, dynasty that they were bringing uh, black slaves from East Africa and then uh, and it was slow for the first thousand years. I, it was, uh, for the people who were slaves, it was too fast. Um, it was a few million slaves uh, had been captured and sold. But by the 16th century and 17th century, the market for slaves increased tremendously. And they were bringing in uh, a million a year, about 900,000 a year through the um, 17th century, and by the 18th century, it was well over a million a year. So these are some of the, you know, uh, and it just takes looking around for more data and, and, and seeing that, the, you know, the popes were against the uh, slave trade and uh, opposed it. Um, but but you got to look it up. you got to look it up. Now, uh, again, you can go online and for papal documents, EWTN.com has not only papal documents, uh, but also the Fathers of the Church, church documents, all kinds. And you can trust our website. Also, Catholic Answers is a great resource. 
and truly check out the claims. There was a, a very foolish writer named Lorraine Bettner who um, wrote a book called Catholicism. I, I think that's what the title of it was, a big, thick book. And it would take about five books, four or five books, to refute the dumb things that he, and false things he says. You gotta check that out. For instance, he said, well, the Pope put the Bible on the, uh, uh, or the Council of Toledo put the Bible on the Index of Forbidden Books in 1224. <clears throat> Wrong answer. Um, the Index of Forbidden Books was started in 1546, 320 years later. But you got to do some research to find out that these are patently false statements uh, that are made. But also you can find out the, the true ones. Uh, claims about what the fathers of the church say. Um, <laughs> was sent uh, an email recently uh, where the, the claim was, well, St. Uh, 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 Annette Athenagoras who was an apologist back writing about the 170s AD. And he didn't mention Jesus Christ. And that just proves that Christ was not considered a uh, God or a milker worker or anything. Look up, take time out, and look up what Athenagoras wrote in his book on the defense of Christians. He was answering not questions of Christology. He was answering questions where pagans accused Christians of immorality. And he was refuting that. Look it up. And then you can also see that while, you know, Athanagoras did not mention Christ explicitly, he did mention the Christians many times in his writing. And to say, well, since he didn't do it, therefore nobody believed that Christ was real. Well, what you want to do is take a look at Pope St. Clement I, who in 95, 80 years earlier, was talking about Jesus Christ. And St. Uh, Ignatius of Antioch did the same in 107. St. Justin Martyr, who was from the Holy Land. He was born and raised there. Um, and uh, yeah, later on became a philosopher. And uh, he mentions uh, about Christ's life and such, and and Jesus and so on. And he said, "Well, Marcus Aurelius doesn't know anything about him." Well, well, yeah, there are a lot of things that Marcus Aurelius didn't write about. He was the emperor and the philosopher, but just because he didn't write about it, doesn't mean that it didn't happen. <laughs> I've never written about, um, you know, nuclear fusion. Um, that doesn't mean that they don't know how to do that. I'm the ignoramus. <laughs> so check, be, when you do blogs, fact check. Don't act like the fake news companies that you see out there who have uh, an unnamed source. <laughs> we can name our sources. All right, and again, remember, you can send us questions by writing to threshold at EWTN.com. And here we have uh, an email from one of the very interesting named places. It's got, it's got a Native American name to it, Pascagoula, Mississippi. Now, th these folks are from Louisiana. You know about Pascagoula and that famous song about squirrels and stuff at church over from Pascagoula. But the, Jerry uh, asked this question. Father Mitch, I've been wondering, if going to confession is so important and everything in our society today is directed toward convenience and what we want, even mass schedules, why not hear confessions over the phone? If the penitent is willing to do it and take the risk, why wouldn't a priest want to meet them halfway? Jerry, Jerry, do you listen to the news? The NSA listens in on your phone conversations. You know, they just, a report just came out that under the uh, last administration, 
uh, President Obama allowed, uh, well, I don't know how much he had to do with it, but there was more listening in on phone conversations than you can shake a stick at. That is, the, this is the last thing that you want. And you had a better chance of not being heard back in the days when we had party lines. That's how old I am. <laughs> I remember party lines where in our neighborhood there was one line and then different people in different houses had the same line. You know, now you walk around with a phone that has no lines. But NSA can monitor your phones. That's the last thing that we should ever do. Is here, and then do you think uh, some people have suggested to me for convenience sake, well, let's have confessions over the internet. <laughs> the NSA is listening in on that too. That's what you don't want. So, no, the priest has to protect your anonymity, even if you don't, or even if you don't, if you think your convenience is more important than the secrecy of your confession. So, given the way that uh, governments, and then you know, the, the Russians, the Russians are hacking stuff. You want the Russians here in your confessions? They're not even Catholic. Well, neither was President Obama or President um, uh, Trump, uh, but we don't want them here in our confessions. You know, they, they, they mentioned a few weeks ago how Mrs. Clinton had used some backdoor negotiation to help a university in Russia develop um, the you know, uh, software uh, program, you know, uh, uh, courses and, yeah, and getting degrees in software. Now, how'd that work out for her? That wasn't such a good idea. And they'd be, and it's not that they just listen to our politicians and such and hack them, but they can hack you too. So no way, no way do we hear confessions over the phone. Thanks for the offer, but no thanks. All right, I'm going to take a break. We'll be back in a couple minutes with more of your emails, so please stay with us. to make sure that we have you come here and join us. We, uh, if you can contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966 or go to our website, ewtn.com. They will give you information about scheduling of masses, uh, time, programs where you can be in the audience, and uh, places to stay and good places to eat. You know, I just sent a couple of people over to uh, Golden Rule Barbecue, and uh, they weren't from this country, but they sure loved it. So uh, I think they're from um, up north. No, no. <laughs> no, they were from, they were from uh, Europe. So they never had Alabama barbecue before. So it's good to have us. And again, we're focusing on emails. Remember, you can send emails with your questions by writing to threshold at EWTN.com. All right, let's take uh, another one here. Uh, Father Paco, what is the Vatican's exact stance on creation versus evolution? Or does a theological viewpoint exist per, per the church? Thanks, Mike in Front Royal, Virginia. All right, now Mike couple things I want to bring up. First, the church does not have an official opinion. The church's attitude towards such things depends on the very nature of science itself. Science is not dogmatic. Science is always doing new research, trying to include new information, new data, and incorporate that data into its theories. And so as a result, the church is always trying 
to deal with the new information that comes along and holds off until the science is settled. That's the nature of science. Now, the church has an extremely positive relationship towards science, but at the same time, uh, it doesn't take too much of a stance. Uh, a good example of that would be that um, the case of Galileo. Galileo proposed that, uh, like Copernicus, that the earth goes around the sun. But he did not have the certain and definite information to prove that was the case. And so Pope Urban you know, said that you can't assert this as if it's proven when you don't have evidence, especially when Galileo said that the, uh, one of the proofs for the earth going around the sun was the tide. And the tide is not evidence that the earth goes around the sun. It has a little influence, but not much. But its primary uh, uh, evidence is for the moon going around the earth. If anything, the use of the tides proved the opposite, namely that the moon goes, is in an orbit around the earth and that the earth is the center of the moon. <laughs> And he was trying to prove that the sun is the center of the solar system. That's simply not the case. So it's, um, but later on, it took a couple hundred more years, especially when they began to observe the orbit of Venus around the sun. And that, especially in the research that they did in the 1700s, demonstrated that the planets go around the sun. And when the church said there's definite evidence, then they went with it. That's what they accepted. And so that's a good thing. And by the way, it was not only secular scientists who were involved in that, but a lot of priests were the astronomers, Jesuits and Dominicans and others, uh, as well as Protestant ministers and not unbelievers and all that, scientific observation should be something apart from religious uh, assumptions. And once the science was proven that the planets go around the sun, then the church said, of course, well, that makes sense. But they, they rejected uh, Galileo, insisting on something for which he had no evidence. That is similar or parallel to the attitude towards evolution. There is a lot of evidence about the development of specific uh, species, but the evidence as regards to the origin of life and everything evolving in uh, certain ways uh, is still out. And so the church says, well, this is, we have to take a look at the theory and see how it develops, and the evidence backing up the theory. And if you um, want to take a look at that, you take a look at a book by Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel was himself uh, and uh, pretty much an atheist agnostic kind of guy. He was a reporter for the Chicago Tribune, and he began to research the question of whether the theory of evolution is true and whether there's any evidence for there being a creator who used his mind to develop creation and invent creation. And he came out, he started off against believing in God as a creator of everything and believing in God at all. He was against it. But the more he talked to scientists, the more he became convinced. And so I think his book is called The Case for the Creator. Uh, I might want to take a look at that. But the church waits, and we'll see what happens with the evidence that we have.
All right, now let us take a look at an email from Elizabeth in Fort Myers, Florida. What are the differences between the Maronite and Latin Rite Mass? Elizabeth. Well, Elizabeth, uh, one of the th differences is their origins. The Latin Rite Mass is a translation of the Mass that was celebrated in Rome into Latin, and Latin became the default language. So, for instance, in Rome, for the first 200 plus years, the Mass was celebrated in Greek. And the uh, liturgy was mostly translated into Latin, except for the Kyrie eleison, Christ eleison, Kyrie eleison, which are Greek. That was one last remnant of the original Greek. But in the third century, they began translating the Mass into Latin. So St. Peter and the others didn't celebrate the liturgy in Latin. They celebrated it in Greek. And in fact, uh, St. Hippolytus, uh, who is a martyr, he, he became an anti-pope. That is, he said the pope that was legitimately elected is dumb. And I'm smart, so I should be pope. And he got himself elected pope. But one of the reasons he thought it was the other guy was so dumb and disagreed with him is that St. Hippolytus did not want the mass in Latin. So we always celebrated in Greek. But he lost um, because people did not know Greek that well. And Latin became the uh, language of the liturgy, and over the uh, and it took from the third century, probably the early part of the third century, all the way into the fourth century before uh, the Latin form of the liturgy was completed, and then as the church spread, uh, especially after the barbarian invasions. The, there were a wide variety of different forms of the Mass in Latin. But the, uh, eventually, the Roman liturgy became the norm because some of the other liturgies got heretical, and that set the, 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 the case, uh, the norm for the um, Latin Mass. That's how you get that. Whereas the Maronite liturgy originated in the city of Antioch. Antioch was the third largest city of the Roman Empire. And it was a city built by Alexander the Great, named after one of his generals, Antiochus Seleucus. And it had a large population of Greeks and a large population of Syrians who spoke Aramaic. And the community had two liturgies in it. The Greek liturgy was taken by the patriarch of Antioch, the bishop, St. John Chrysostom, and he brought that Greek liturgy to Constantinople, and the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom became the normal liturgy of the Byzantine Rite. But then the Aramaic liturgy in Antioch became the basis for a number of uh, three different rites. Uh, the Syriac rite, the Maronite rite, which is also a Syrian, Syriac language rite, and the Syro Malankara, which is in, from India, because it spread down to India. This liturgy uses that Western dialect of Aramaic, which is now known as Syriac. And that is the language of the liturgy. So the Maronite liturgy uses the Aramaic language, the Syriac dialect, as its default language. And the, there's a different structure to the liturgy. Now you see, 
For instance, there's a Gloria. Uh, that, that's common. There's also the Hosolio prayer, which is a prayer for forgiveness, a long uh, uh, prayer that is at every liturgy. The Trisagion, that is Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us. That's always said or sung. Uh, we usually sing it in Aramaic. Uh, even in this country, we sing that in Aramaic. Um, and our children at, the, at our parishes know that. And the whole liturgy can be done in Aramaic, but it's also been translated into Arabic, English, French, Spanish, and other languages because today not many people speak Syriac dialect of Aramaic anymore. But the liturgy is in that uh, Aramaic language, and you can do it all in that language, or you can do only some parts. The main parts that we still use Aramaic for are the entrance, uh, you know, we sing that, the Trisagion, Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, the consecration, or the entrance to the offertory, the consecration, and the epiclesis, that is, the, uh, hear us, O Lord, hear us, O Lord, hear us, O Lord, send your Holy Spirit to hover over this gift, these gifts. So the calling down of the Holy Spirit. Those are the parts that are done in Aramaic. And there are a few other differences, but what's amazing are the similarities. Not only the Gloria, the prayer for forgiveness, then the reading from the uh, epistles and the gospel, and then that's followed by a sermon, the offertory. Now at that point, right after the offertory is the sign of peace. And then we move into the preface, just like in the Roman, right? With the same dialogue, the Lord be with you and with your spirit, lift up your hearts, lift them up to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts. There's a form of that. And after the preface is the holy, 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 just as in the Western rite. And then the uh, uh, anaphora or the consecration, and then after that, petitions, and then after that, uh, the Our Father, uh, well, the fraction, right, then the Our Father, then communion, and then final prayers. Very similar structure. What's amazing is how similar the structure is, even though it has differences and differences of language, slight differences of structure. What does that indicate? That similarity of structure goes back to the way the apostles celebrated the Mass and taught the Mass to the early Christians because you see that same structure through all the rites. It's very interesting to note the similarities and differences. Come to a uh, uh, Maronite Mass if you get a chance. Yeah, I think you'll enjoy it. Oh, now we have another email. This is from Joe in Illinois. Father Packer, with the 500-year anniversary of the Reformation being this year, I'm wondering why the Catholic Church is so big on celebrating Martin Luther, a commemorative Vatican stamp honoring Luther, among other things. I don't see why we are supposed to celebrate the shredding of Christendom. It's like saying to a spouse who left you, hey, let's celebrate the anniversary of our divorce. I don't get it. All right, uh, Joe, uh, I don't think this is meant to be a celebration of the shredding of Christianity, the, the breaking up of the union. It's rather a recognition that this is a big celebration by various Protestant communities, especially the Lutherans. Um, 1517, in October 1517, is when Luther hung up the 95 Theses. Uh, that's 500 years ago. And so it's looking back. Now, as we all know, um, he did, he, you know, started that, uh, what they call the Reformation in the end of October of, 20, of 1517. By December, so just, you know, l less than two months later, he was already calling the Pope Antichrist. And Pope, uh, Leo X was returning the favor. Uh, though, I, I must say this, when you read the documents, and I urge you to do so, you can go and find the uh, documents uh, that you know, tell Luther that he needs to repent. 
And actually you see that the Pope was very charitable. He was trying to reconcile. He was, in fact, the, the more you study the history, the more complex you see it is. He was so focused on trying to prevent the Turks from conquering Hungary, which they were about to do. They had just conquered Constantinople 60 years earlier. And now they were threatening uh, Hungary. And it, Hungary was in great danger. And he was trying to get the European kings, stop fighting amongst yourselves. Let's go and stop the Turks from invading Europe. That, it was very dangerous. And in fact, they did conquer Hungary by 1526. So he's focused on that. And then Luther's doing this and, you know, he's not paying attention till it's too late. Um, and he wanted it to be handled locally. Um, it also brings up the fact that there were problems in parts of the church. The whole church was not corrupt. That would be a completely false statement. You know, the, the church was pretty in, in pretty good shape, actually, in England. A little lackadaisical sometimes, but uh, not corrupt. And a few corrupt people here and there, but really the church in England was in good shape. Um, you know, you can read the book Stripping the Altars uh, to get a good sense of that. Spain was, was uh, strong in the faith. There was no problem there, and that's what they didn't have uh, the reform come down there. But Germany had problems because some of the clergy were trying to get money out of the, the, the Germans. That was a real problem. And it's very much um, uh, something that we have to keep in mind, and that instead of the rancor that developed early on. Um, Master Eck, a Dominican, was pretty strong on uh, criticizing Luther, and Luther was really nasty toward the Pope. Well, Luther was nasty to everybody. If you were a Protestant who disagreed with Luther, he had all kinds of nasty expletives. Matter of fact, if you remember the earlier email that I had about the guy who had a problem with foul language, Luther should have heard that, because he, if you read his table talk, especially in German, um, I can't say those things on the air. Um, but, it is, but this rancor that existed at the time has eased up. And presently, the Lutheran church is really shrinking a lot. There's a lot that we have to offer, and I think the attempts at this time are to bring some reconciliation and you no know, fully reconciliation. Let's see if that does anything good for us and for the Lutherans. All right, let's see. This is from PL in Kansas. Father Mitch, most of us, if not all of us, suffer from certain temptations that are especially difficult to overcome. As a result, we find ourselves confessing the same sins. So frequently, in fact, that the sins might correctly be labeled as being habitual. I recently heard a priest give a homily on such matters, and he said that, quote, there comes a point when God forgives a soul no more. Father Pack, is that true? At some point, God will no longer forgive a soul of certain sins? P.L. in Kansas. I, P.L., I don't know what that priest was thinking. I, I, I don't know what he meant by that. The only time God will not forgive a person is if the person, A, refuses to take personal responsibility for sin. If you say, it's not, I didn't do anything wrong, it's not my fault then how can you be forgiven? You can't. Again, you know, anybody who has kids, no, I, that's their standard answer. I don't know. I don't know who did it. <laughs> well, God does know who did it, like moms and dads know who did it. And uh, if, you, if you don't know, think back if you're a parent and you see um, that there are crumbs and ice cream all over the kid's mouth. I don't know who took the ice cream and cookies. 
<laughs> and you say, you know, you're going to get double punishment, right? Because you lied to me. I was so bad as a liar. I, I had to learn to stop just because I always got caught. I just wasn't good at it. That's why I'm not in politics. As and I digress. But, you know, the second reason that a person won't get forgiven is if they refuse to be sorry. Some people say, I don't care. I want to do the sin. I like my sin. I'm not sorry. Then God can't forgive the person. But that is extremely, uh, I find it is fairly rare. Uh, there, there's a lot of people who don't want to be forgiven. Uh, they're, they're not sorry. They don't take responsibility. A lot of, I say a lot more often people don't take responsibility for their own sin. They blame society, everybody else. Um, but this is, um, uh, the, the, this is one of those things that uh, God can't forgive. But any person who commits a sin again and again and again and again and is sorry every time, and is really trying to change, but they have a weakness within them that makes it difficult to change. Uh, you know, there, there's one saint who's now the patron saint of drug addicts. He could not stop. He was addicted to heroin. Well, it was opium. He, he, he was a Chinese man, and the, uh, he was addicted to opium. And he couldn't stop. He wouldn't go to Holy Communion in the state of sin. But he did not know how to stop. But he was sorry. And the reason he became a saint, his name is Matthew. I don't remember his last name. His name is, first name is Matthew. The reason he became a saint is that when the boxers, during the Boxer Rebellion, said, well, just give up your Catholicism and we'll let you go. He said, no. I know that Catholicism is true. I'd rather die. So they cut his head off. They killed him. So he died a martyr and became a saint. And he's the patron saint of drug addicts. Now he tried and tried. And the church has every confidence that God could forgive him. And having dealt with many, many people who try to overcome alcohol and drug addiction, I believe that that's the case. Um, then also, we have one from Janice in Canada. Uh, Hi, Father Mitch. What is the scientific, atheistic, non-believer explanation of the miracle of the sun at Fatima? Love your program. Thanks, Janice. Janice, there is one. <laughs> they don't have an explanation. There are a lot of atheists there at Fatima and on uh, uh, October 13th, 1917, but that no... Uh, explanation for it and um, uh, and it's something uh, I actually uh, got to know I roomed with for a little while uh, doing a documentary uh, the uh, an actor uh, Martin Sheen now his real name is Estevez he took the name Sheen from Archbishop Sheen but he um, that's, that's a stage name but uh, Martin Sheen said that his father was living in Spain. He was a young man in Spain. And he saw the miracle of the sun over in Spain. He was nowhere near the crowds. He didn't know what was going on in Fatima. But he saw the miracle of the sun, and he passed that on. So that indicates this was not group hypnosis or delusion or group hallucination or something like that. Um, it, it was something that they can't explain. There's no physical atheistic explanation. And the atheistic newspaper reporters at the scene said so, especially when the whole ground and all the clothes were immediately dried up. All right, well. Thank you for joining us, and may Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And stay curious and keep studying and learning more. But also, remember that this network is brought to you by you, so please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. And then we will be able to pay all of our bills too.
God bless and thank you. Thank you.